we've been eagerly awaiting the upcoming CXO power panel. It not only is powerful, it also sounds very mystical. Navigating the next talent at the heart of strategy. To take this forward, please welcome Sapnesh Lala, CEO and Executive Director, NIIT Limited, in discussion with Anuj Malhotra, Senior Partner and Vice President, Service Lines and Operations, IBM, Chetan Garga, MD, All State India, Pramila Kalive, Chief Operating Officer, Zensar Technologies Limited, Venkat Raman, SV Managing Director, ANZ India. Over to you, Sapnesh. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dilly. And uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for taking the time today. Uh, I hope all of you are staying safe and your teams are stay, uh, staying safe as well. Uh, from what I hear, uh, the cases are rising, but the severity is not as high. So hopefully it will stay that way. But uh, thanks uh, again for joining and taking the time. Uh, uh, this is uh, a discussion around uh, navigating the challenges of talent. And uh, the way I would really like to start is to uh, cycle through each one of you uh, to introduce yourselves. Uh, uh, it's quite likely that most, most, most of the audience knows you and a little bit about your companies, but it will be useful to point out a few interesting things that the audience might not know. Uh, so uh, uh, do introduce yourselves uh, as well as, you know, as corny as it might sound, uh, it looks like there is a war for talent out there. Uh, and uh, the other day, uh, when I was talking about this, uh, somebody said it's not just the war for talent, it's also the war for recruiters because we don't have enough recruiters to recruit talent. So that aside, uh, as corny as it might sound, uh, do talk about your specific challenges uh, about talent, if you are having them. I mean, some of you might not, but uh, if, if you are having those challenges, uh, uh, go beyond uh, the words that everyone knows in uh, talk a little bit about uh, how you are facing those challenges. Uh, and then uh, over the session, we'll try to go about figuring out, uh, so what are you doing about it and what might be uh, some of the battles you have won and some of the battles that you are yet to win, but what are the strategies that you might be using to win these battles. Uh, but let's get started uh, with you introducing yourselves uh, and a little bit about uh, talent-related challenges uh, that you are starting to face or you are facing. Uh, I guess let's let's get started with Anuj first. I'll try to go uh, in the alphabetical order, but I might screw it up. But uh, let's let's start with uh, Anuj first. Thanks, Apnesh, and I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Anuj Malhotra. I run all these service lines and technologies uh, for the global delivery centers that we have around the world. And I also manage the operations and, and everything else that comes around, including hiring for our center in India as well. I mean, we have multiple uh, locations in India. Um, been in the industry for over 30 different years uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, but when you talk about it, I don't think we have seen a challenge like this, uh, at least in my 30 years. It's a pretty interesting time to be in the IT industry, right? Um, it is a challenge where the demand for talent is outstripping the supply, or at least seemingly so. And uh, it's also called causing some bad behaviors. People are shopping around for you know uh, jobs. Uh, it's created a very uh, interesting uh, situation from a talent perspective. Uh, great time to be a techie, I should say that. Uh, demand is in pretty much every technology you can imagine, not just cloud or digital transformation, but testing and basic Java development across the board, right? So we are in an ecosystem where, you know, the demand's extremely high and, uh, you know, there's, there's limited talent that most of us are going after. Uh, it's also kind of a, uh, you know, when we started, I mean, I'm just going to play back a few years ago, right? I mean, when we were finishing uh, 2019, beginning 2020, and, and, and then COVID came around, pretty much everywhere around the world, people stopped capital projects, people stopped developing projects. Uh, we had, you know, a situation where we had more bench than we would have wanted. And it was like, you know, you know, pretty much sounded like everybody's just gone into their, you know, back hole saying, we're not going to do any capital investment. Uh, development projects stopped and all of that, right? By the time we were ending 2020 and beginning of last year, 2021, it sounded like everybody had come out of a slumberland 
around the world and there was unparalleled demand coming from pretty much every client that we have and the new ones that we're signing. Um, and that created a demand which was unparalleled. I mean, it just uh, was, a, was the, the ecosystem and, and the systems in our organization also were possibly not ready for that scale, right? And then that caused obviously the challenge that we haven't done with the market. So it's, a, it's an interesting time. I think uh, it's a challenge. It's an interesting challenge to have. We had a net growth of about 40% last year, which is something we are very happy about. Uh, but could have been even more if there was enough, uh, you know, ways to address the talent shortage that we have. Right? Uh, but good. But it looks to like have. it's going good to, to have. Yeah, good talent to have, and it looks like it's going to stay like this for a, for for the next. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we started our quarter planning, and I think um, towards December, and now obviously uh, we don't see uh, any kind of respite in the demand that's coming our way. Extremely high. Yeah. So. Uh, Good, good times to be in. Uh, it's a good problem to solve, I guess. Agree fully. Chetan. Thanks, Apneesh, and hi, everyone. Uh, let me just give a quick brief about Allstate. Uh, Allstate is a very large insurance company in the personal and casualty space, typically in home and auto. Uh, in the US, we are ranked uh, 17 in the Fortune 500 list, and Large revenues about $45 billion. So if you can imagine, you know, bigger than LIC, just as a as a benchmark, right? Um, in India. Now it's an interesting time, and I think Anuj has delayed it out quite well that uh, there's a lot of uh, fun stuff happening. Fun, I say in a <laughs> in a with a tongue-in-cheek way, because it's fun for some, not so much fun for others who are grappling with trying to keep up to the pace of demand and need. Uh, but I'm going to share with you a few examples just to highlight what talent does and brings for us. Now, typically, insurance is considered a very you know conservative place. Nothing really moves. It's there for years and years, and it's people you know don't really want insurance. They're forced to buy it sometimes by regulators. If you have a car and you need to have car insurance and things like that, but the way it's changing, and it's changing because of talent and people, and that's why it becomes so important for us, right? Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. Most of us had our cars parked in their place for the last two years, right? Nobody was traveling anywhere. Um, but you're paying the same insurance, right? You didn't get any respite on your insurance typically. And I think most of us felt, what the hell? We're paying for that insurance for a car that's parked going nowhere. Usage-based insurance was the answer, is the answer. And... You know, we built a product in the US called MileWise, where you just pay for insurance on per trip basis. You drive 10 miles, you pay for those 10 miles. While you do a basic insurance cover for you know, uh, natural calamities like snowstorms or floods or hailstorms, etc. That's a very minimal thing. But then you just pay on a need basis. Phenomenal product, right? Huge take up during the last two years. How do we go come about with it? You need that talent. Now, you know, while we all talk about the Amazons and the Ubers and the Googles, they are not the only guys who need this talent. We need it as much as anybody else, right? And there are a number of ex other examples. I'll give you another one very quickly. If you look at a typical car product, right, car insurance, the rubber hits the road when somebody has a claim. And that claim process can be very, very complex, messy, irritating, frustrating, everything. Now, today we are doing virtual claims. Take a video of the damage. Don't need to go anywhere. Post it. The adjuster sees it. And your claim is settled right? Uh, all done virtually, all done within hours, not even days, and to the satisfaction of the customer. And the situation is that there is this need for top talent everywhere. We are all fighting for this top talent who's going to help us innovate and be at the cutting edge of technology, of ideation, of business models, and we're all kind of struggling with it. I also feel that it's a, I think Sapneesh, you said it's a good problem to have. Yes, possibly, because you're all now going to be forced to look at talent in very different ways, right? Whether it's, you know, the gig economy, and we talk a bit more about it, whether it's allowing people to work flexi hours and when they want to and for an outcome-based model and things like that, I think that's going to be a very interesting situation that we're all forced into. I think that's going to be the holy grail in many ways to who can crack that to get to a position which balances talent needs and business needs. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion on that. No, you're so right. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't know you guys were behind it, but I was really thankful to get my check back on not driving my car 
uh, too long the last couple of years. So thank you for innovating and thank you for returning some of the money. Uh, but yeah, actually, you, Sapne, we gave back one billion dollars to our customers in the US. One billion dollars. Well, a little Just bit of that back. came to me as well. So thank you. <laughs> Keep doing that. <laughs> But uh, but it is it is amazing what uh, these two years got people to think and do. And I think uh, uh, what what you're starting to say is that it gave us the opportunity to think out of the box because something happened, and that thinking out of the box led to great outcomes. And that has snowballed into if you can do this, you can do many other things, and therefore why not? So uh, I think that. Uh, initial innovation and seeing success has caused uh, an expectation of significantly higher levels of innovation. And as innovation creates customer satisfaction, uh, everybody wants more for, you know, uh, the fact that you gave away a billion dollars, people are not going to stop there. And the fact that you made the claims process so much easier, people will want other processes to become easier and so on and so forth. So there is higher expectation. What you could do in two years. Now people will think that you could do it in three months also, and then maybe one month. So uh, uh, that's why I th thought it is a great problem to have, a great expectation to have. I guess uh, the key is how do we fulfill it? Uh, and let's let's go to uh, uh, Pramila, you uh, uh, talk a little bit about yourself and uh, Zensar and uh, uh, how you look at uh, talent. Thank you. Thank you, Sapnesh. Uh, Anuj and Chetan, thanks for setting the, you know, uh, context. And uh, Zensar is, again, a global uh, technology company, services company headquartered in Pune. In fact, this year, 2022, is a milestone year for us. It's, we're going to be 100 years in the business, though the name wow. Zensar is a very, very young name. Uh, as a business, uh, 1922 is when the business was born. We went through multiple avatars. We were Ikim, ICL, Ikim Fujitsu, and then of course in the Zensar Avatar, it's uh, <clears throat> 22 years. Uh, I am a very, very proud Zensarian in my 30 plus years career, but my last 21 years have been in Zensar, still counting, very, very proud. Being through the journey of Zensar, growing from a family of 500 Zensarians to about 11 uh, thousand now across the globe. And so I've seen several refresh cycles of the industry and the company itself. But like Anuj called out, never before uh, have I seen, you know, or all of us have seen what we're seeing here. If you look at what's happening, um, I don't have to talk about the role that COVID played specifically in accelerating the pace of, you know, digital transformation, whether it's for businesses like Allstate that Chetan called out or what we are doing in IBM and Zensar elsewhere to partner with clients to take them through it. Uh, but it's unprecedented what we are seeing in terms of demand. But I'm also seeing an all-time high, not just in demand, all-time high in the rate at which we are making offers, all-time high, the rate at which people are dropping out and not turning up, not accepting offers, all-time high on attrition. So it's been one of those phases where everything is off the charts. And for all of us on this call and those who are hearing in, I'm sure none of our management rule books or HR playbooks prepared us for this phase. So there are you know, no rules that we can go and follow and say, oh, we haven't done these 10 things. Let's try and do this to retain our talent or to attract talent. And hence, I really think platforms like this, and I would want to thank NIT for this, are great opportunities for us to learn from each other, learn from how all of us are coping with this, innovation, best practices, next practices we pick up from each other. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to share. So thanks for this uh, platform. Uh, in Zensar, again, if five years back, there would be no conference, I'm sure, anywhere in the world where we didn't talk digital, we didn't talk digital transformation. Today, there will be no conference where we don't talk talent. So talent has come back, you know, straight uh, in the middle of everything else. Uh, and if the role that culture played in an organization, if we have forgotten about it, I think the last two to three years have taught all of us saying how your people, your culture, people are really what differentiate, you know, each uh, a successful company from a company that's trying to be successful. So really looking forward to the conversations. And as we go through this session, I'm sure we'll all have an opportunity to dig deeper into what are we trying to do, what's working and not working. No, so true. Uh, and uh, I would go out and say, uh, on both sides of uh, uh, both in 2020, 
and 21, we saw the shoe move from one foot to the other at this time or maybe a couple of months out uh, this time in 2020 we were not looking at hiring talent we were actually figuring out how to retain or what to do with the bench we had and i mean it's no secret all of us tore our hair out whoever had the good fortune of having hair uh, uh, to figure out what are we going to do uh, it sounded like the world was coming to an end and uh, Everyone seemed to have more people than they needed. And within six months or less than one year, uh, the shoe is now on the other, other foot. And uh, I think, or I'm guessing, organizations who believed in people are the ones who people trust. And uh, uh, people would come back to organizations who were good to people and uh, may not to organizations who are not necessarily very good to their people. So uh, uh, very, very, very interesting times. And it looks like uh, it's not like you can, you know, close your eyes and these times will go away and we'll wake up three days later and things will be much better. It doesn't look like it's going to be like that. But uh, thanks, uh, uh, Pramila. Venki? Thank you. Thank you, Sapnesh. I hope I'm audible. Um, Indeed. It's my pleasure to be here in this panel and I represent ANZ Banking Group. Uh, as you, many of you may be aware, ANZ is among the largest banks in the Australia New Zealand area. Um, and we are one of the early adopters of this offshoring model. And we came back came to India in 1989 to set up our technology shop. Uh, we have got captive centers like what we have in Bangalore, in Manila and in Chengdu. And uh, uh, you know, about 20% of our FTEs sit out of these service centers. And so for us, the story of talent in the service centers is very, very crucial. Uh, banking, a bit like insurance, Lagarde, as far as you know, very large innovations were concerned for a long time. So it's now playing catch up. And we being in that ecosystem of uh, India, startups, et cetera, uh, we are probably the, the core of the, the engine that drives innovation in the, in the, uh, in the bank for us. Um, interest in all of, uh, you know, what we term as ABCD, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud, uh, you know, we are, and data, and we are working a, a lot in, in all these areas. Uh, last two years, extremely interesting. In fact, I, I just saw a meme, um, uh, which was quite funny. Uh, the slide was titled, who led digital transformation in your company? And the options were CEO, CIO, and option three was COVID, and everyone had circled COVID. So, uh, we know what actually led to digital transformation in industries which were slow uh, and they got the momentum in the last couple of years as well. Uh, uh, coming to the talent piece, while we are in this ecosystem of large unicorns, large number of unicorns, uh, and I heard a new term called sunicorns, which are unicorns about to happen. So between the unicorns, sunicorns, uh, you know, we have access to tremendous amount of technology advanced uh, uh, technology, great talent, etc. It also leads to significant amount of, uh, uh, you know, battle for the talent. And you mentioned war. I think this is this is uh, going to get more and more serious with everyone in looking for similar kind of talent. We are going to see a period when there is going to be a, a mad rush uh, for the right skills. And as Anuj, I think, mentioned that it's good to be a techie. It, it's fantastic to be a skillful a talented person, it doesn't matter which area you are, I believe that this is an area where smart people will get grabbed and will get opportunities that we have not seen before. Uh, obviously, like everyone else, we are also facing the same, uh, same battle, given that uh, we are also donning the innovation hat for the bank here, it makes it imperative for us to capture the discussion is very crucial. This discussion will, will give us ideas that we can all implement. And I'm looking forward for the, for the next 40 odd minutes uh, to hear from my co-panelists as well as from the audience, you know, some smart thoughts and ideas which will help us navigate these tough times. So thanks, thanks. And it's, it's so interesting. Like Pramila was saying, for the last five years, we've been talking about digital transformation. We got an opportunity and it looks like uh, we did well. I mean, uh, digital transformation actually worked and worked in a short period of time. So now there are expectations and now we have to deliver uh, on the expectations. And I guess talent is core to meeting those expectations. So I guess uh, 
the next question and you know uh, it's your choice i won't try to go in alphabetical order or any order at all it's really your choice uh, but uh, so what do we do about it what are you doing about it what have you tried what has worked what has not worked more importantly uh, and uh, uh, what do you think could work that you are betting on for future I can take a shot at you know what we are doing, right? I think uh, I talked about exciting times. Yeah, I mean, um, like Pramila said, uh, and I guess both Venki and and Chetan as well. The offers we are selling in the market is is next to never before. Right? We have not uh, tried to chase talent as much as we've done now in our entire history. Um, there are two parts to the chase, right? One is the volume. I mean, we do need to get to some volume that we have to. And the other is the speed slash agility with which we can bring it in because there are projects um, that we have signed up around the world. Um, I'm sure Chetan, you and uh, Venki's organization have projects to deliver as well. And there are multiple things that we have to do and we've been doing this for the last one year uh, uh, to try and make sure that we are able to staff all the transformation that we need to deliver for our principles, right? Or, or our clients. Um, I'll, I'll just break it into external and internal, right? Uh, if I look at what we're doing externally, um, one was the volume business, right? Uh, you know, our conversion rates in the market were down to the 60s and 50s and 40s, which means you send out 100 offers and you get about 40 people who walk into your door, uh, which meant you had to do more volumes. Uh, we had to try and interview more, many more people uh, to make sure we had the volumes to get us the uh, you know, the, the, the outcomes that we needed in terms of headcount that we needed overall. Um, so we did go back and look at, uh, you know, getting agencies to come and train them and ask them to do the interviews and scale up for us, right? This is one thing we did. We, we got a couple of agencies that do that for us today, right? We trained them, we handpicked the interviewers, and then we deployed them saying, okay, you can go and hire for us and, and work with us, right? So we did that. We also started looking at what we call as adjacent skills, right? So when we said, okay, we don't, we have a shortage of talent in a specific set of skills. Can I go hire adjacent skills and train up with partners like NIT or train up with our own training agents, right? So we said, okay, let's go get adjacent skills and not just try and find them in the market because it's just too expensive to find them in the market. Um, that was another thing we did, right? Uh, then we ran programs, uh, we call it Accelerate Together, where when we send the offers out, our conversions weren't great. So we had to make sure that people understand what IBM is all about. And we had to then, we brought our leadership together and you know, once a month we ran programs where we brought in everybody we had sent to offer out to, um, onto a program with the leadership, a, a virtual program saying, you know, this is us, ask questions. You can ask me anything, basically types, right? And you know, they got to know the leadership. They got to know the company. Um, we did throw in some entertainment from IBM or something that too. And it, it was a way to connect to people saying, look, this is IBM. Um, we would have loved to have you in our shop to come and meet us and talk to us. But in the virtual world, you know, this is what we are all about. So if you are considering and you're considering two, three options, consider us higher than the others. Basically. And that was something that I guess we did as well. We did go back and do a lot of drives around, uh, uh, you know, uh, what we call as DNI. Uh, bringing women back to work and all of that as well. So that's that's all external. And of course, we did go to the to the to these grad schools because some of the latest you know uh, technologies are better handled by them than by people who have been in technology for a long time. They they can't adapt as fast. Internally, we ran a few things as well. Uh, we ran a very very strong referral program, uh, which was on steroids with all kinds of you know options for people to bring in people. Right. We did do lots of rotations. Um, so we gave opportunities for resources to go and work on your technology so they wouldn't leave us. And we could also fulfill the open seats that we had while backfilling with uh, people who are just coming to the company, right? We, we also uh, brought together our alumni group and ran that as well. So there's a series of things that we also did internally um, around it. And then last but not the least, we started a tier two city campaign which we had not done earlier. Uh, we opened Mysore. We are looking at a few other tier two cities because you know, employees just don't want to come back in some cases. If he's gone back to Bhuvneshwar, if he's gone back to Cochin, if he's gone back to Kwambito, I mean, they would love us to have an office right there, right? And rather than having to come back to this city and work with us here. So we also ran a tier two campaign um, uh, to try and make sure that 
we have centers open closer to where people are based, um, families are based and try and make that happen. So that's the kind of stuff that we're doing actually in the center. I would love to hear other inputs as well. Looks like you're doing everything that I can think of, but out of all the things that you did, uh, what might be the things that didn't quite work uh, compared to what your expectation was? Okay, so one thing that we did, which I didn't talk about, was also to look at saying, how much are we willing to um, spend on this, right? I mean, how far should we go? Right, and I'm sure that's a question that all of us on the panel had, right? How much money do you want to throw at this uh, product? And that's something we could not do as much we were, as we wanted, right? I mean, um, there are joining bonuses going on. There are very high comp ratios going out. Um, there is no connect between experience and comp being asked. So that's something that, you know, we, you know, because of the pace at which we had to go and the volumes that we had to do, uh, we could not plan it as well as we would have wanted to plan. Not, not, not a worry though. I mean, it's just that it did help us grow significantly. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would have loved to do something better there, basically, if you ask me. And and even now going forward, right? I mean, it's, it's a challenge that we all have to face. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? And I'll, I'll just nuance uh, 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 the question uh, with a comment. Uh, uh, I know we all look for an ideal fit for who we want to hire. Uh, and a lot of times that ideal fit is on where, the, where was the person educated, how did the guy do in education, uh, what is their experience, uh, how closely it fits what we need. But uh, uh, as, as you're talking about your experience, uh, do, in case you tried it, uh, talk about uh, shifting the hiring mechanism to potential rather than what's available on paper. And how did you look at potential actually one of the things that we did sort of aligned with what anuj was talking about is look at the internal talent very differently so allow people to explore allied areas and so that they can see a growth path and we call this you know exploring allowing people to explore their e and m uh, skills you know e uh, representing experience expertise the area that they know m representing two vertical bars with multiple expertise across allied areas so once we encourage them. This was a combination through training, through just the just the in, in excitement of trying a new technology or trying a new area. And we found a lot of takers here. Uh, what it meant is this is the hard grind, right? So you have to do two things. One is to, to look at your existing requirements. You have to train, coach people uh, a little differently in, in allied areas. Much easier in a functional banking area than in the technology space. And then you have to actually go out and backfill them through, uh, you know, hires there. That's where this potential piece came along, uh, Sapnesh. And we looked at a lot of people when we were trying to backfill who may not have had 100% fitment into the roles that we want, but got, get them in and then allow them to explore not necessarily only one functional area, but let them try and figure out where they fit in. I think we got some good outcomes from that. The other bit which yielded good, strong results was, you know, just widening the talent pool. So Anuj briefly mentioned about returning women uh, into the workforce. We did a, a very, very large campaign for this. We ended up with a significant number of, uh, uh, you know, very highly qualified, but, you know, people with career breaks coming in. And that helped us uh, bridge a lot of the senior level gaps, you know, at least we could we could get them going in the other bit that we intensified for ourselves we haven't done this before in a large scheme i'm sure you guys are past masters that this is the is the graduate internship program you know get get into the campuses early and look for people to come in i think these three were stuff that really helped us uh, get through this so a lot of allied hirings using the internal talent pool and then backfilling through potential uh, smart candidates so let me just thanks, add on thanks. that as well uh, and Sapneesh to the same point. So one is, I think, adding on to what Venki just said, we also included veterans in that return program. We said, hey, there are all these veterans out there who've got amazing experience and skills, and how do we bring them into the workforce in a practical way? That was one additional channel along with uh, women employees returning, returning after a break and others. The second thing to your point, uh, Sapneesh, about looking for potential, right? You know, within our own organizations, we have so much talent sitting there and we are overly critical about them to say, hey, you're not yet ready for the next role because you don't have A, B, C, D, right? And so what we started doing and we're doing, we're in process of doing it is saying, number one, if I have got 50 open positions 
and I've got at least 50 people who are top creators sitting there waiting to for the next move. Why are we not matching these? And even if they are 60% fit, that's good enough, right? Because we know the person, they've been with us for a few years, we know their potential, their performance and so on. Great, let's go with the 60% fit rather than looking for 100% fit. That's one. Second is we said, hey, we have these people who've been sitting here for two years, three years in us in the same role. How do we nudge them into looking at different roles? So rather than them doing it themselves, we got our managers and talent groups to say, hey, let's start nudging and in some ways forcing some internal job rotations, right? Rather than waiting for them to pick it up. So I think all these, in addition to whatever Anuj said, right, were all things that we looked at to tackle this whole thing, finishing schools, graduate programs, the works. Excellent, excellent. Uh, no, I, I think, I think uh, the important thing is that we've, we've tried many things. Uh, and the reason why I asked uh, the question about potential uh, versus uh, what the resume might say was really going back to uh, how NIT was formed. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, NIT was formed on the promise that people have potential. Uh, at that time, uh, there were only uh, 3,000 folks who could get into engineering college. Uh, so there were, by and large, no, uh, uh, I mean, today, uh, uh, India graduates more than a million engineers. But uh, when NIT started, India used to graduate maybe 3,000 engineers per year. And the IT revolution was just about starting. Uh, one of the things NIT did was to say, uh, even at that time, India used to graduate more than 5 million BSc uh, graduates uh, 40 years ago. Uh, they, India does about 8 million today. And we said that, I mean, just as the 3,000 who got in, there were at least 300,000 who could have got in, or 3 million who have the potential, but didn't get an opportunity to get into engineering school or didn't choose to go into engineering school, but still have the potential. So uh, the point I was trying to make and would love to get your reaction on it is, are you, or have you tried, succeeded or not succeeded in very fundamentally changing your recruitment criteria? And I'm not saying with respect to potential versus, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's on the resume, but have you looked at very fundamental changes to how you look at recruitment criteria. And uh, it'll be great to hear where you have tried it and what success or failure you've had with those experiences. So Sapneesh, um, I just want to add a few thoughts even to the earlier topic was I think between Anuj and uh, Venki and Chetan, they've covered you know, most of that is what all of us in different shape or different magnitude, we're all trying out. But a couple of things, we fundamentally have um, now recognized the fact that talent is everybody's business, largely the leadership business and not just an HR functions business. The HR teams can give the frameworks, the tools and the playbooks, but it is everybody in the organization, whether you're a leader, you're a manager, has to own the responsibility of in our holding on to our talent, investing in the development and bringing in new talent. So that shift has happened. So there's a tremendous partnership with the HR function, specifically the talent acquisition team, right? And today, if there is one team we all have to invest in and engage with, that's the talent acquisition team. I think they are under tremendous pressure, tremendous fatigue. And I'm sure uh, the highest attrition numbers will be in that function. I think you started the conversation saying most difficult to find. You'll get a full stack Java engineer, but you will not get a good recruiter. Hire a full stack Java engineer. So that is a first shift. The second thing we said, let's break the problem down. So we are about 11,000 Zensarians. We said, okay, go back to all 11,000 Zensarians. We said each of us, if we brought in one person into the organization, just one go back to an ex zensarian go back to somebody who worked in our team, somebody who somewhere else is in your, in your network. And we bring in 11,000, we're home and dry for the year. Now, how difficult can it be if I just said, Pramila, you have to bring one person, own the responsibility of making the offer, converting the offer, the person has a good onboarding experience and comes into the workforce. So we've kind of distributed the responsibility to all zensarians broken it down. And that's, work in progress that's going on. But I think that's one. The second, like I said, we are spending a lot of time in partnering with the uh, talent acquisition team, the last mile team. The last mile recruiter is the ambassador of, you know, 
Zensar is actually the value proposition. She is communicating that to the potential candidate. And often if they're not aligned with why should you join the organization, we can, we can have the best EVPs articulated on the websites and the career pages. But the touch point is somebody out there, the recruiter. So if she is not engaged with the organization, so I think those are two big shifts that uh, Sapnesh, we are uh, doing uh, on, and 50% uh, of Zensa's leadership time, whether you're doing an operational review or we're doing a strategic discussion is about uh, talent. While we do what is here and now to get out of this, but the longer term, I think again, uh, the panel is called out, is taking a huge bet on organic talent build and on uh, freshers because that's the only way. And even if they are, again, Chetan called out, it makes a lot of sense to take a bet on a 60% fit sensarian than hope a 100% fit new hire will join us and will culturally fit into the organization and stay with us. So again, these are small steps we are taking uh, to try, you know, how do we kind of accelerate the whole uh, talent supply chain? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I mean, very true. Uh, I really like the each one get one. Uh, uh, formula. Yeah, you're right. If everyone got one, then you will be home and dry and uh, no real challenge. Uh, uh, coming back to what I was uh, starting to ask uh, uh, in terms of uh, any fundamental changes that you may have made in how you look at folks that you hire. Uh, and again, I, I uh, was starting to provide the example of uh, what an IIT started on, which was uh, uh, where uh, with with some education, supplemental education, a BSc guy could be just as good as, and no disrespect to go, those who went to engineering school, but uh, uh, a guy who did a BSc could just be as good uh, as an engineer could be in performing a job. Uh, uh, this was 40 years ago. Uh, but uh, as you look at the fundamentals of who you recruit, are you looking at or have you made any fundamental changes or mindset changes in who you recruit, what you recruit for? So uh, I'll just continue with the point. So the big shift, Satnesh, we are saying is now we are, we moved away from hiring for an open indent or hiring for a job or for a position. We've said as an organization, we've taken a bet on five or six technologies in chosen domains. And we said we have to hire you know, raw talent that has an intrinsic potential and the agency. And it is our job as leaders then to, and we realize that. So our proactive hiring today is three times the scale of a reactive hiring. Reactive is for a confirmed customer. Proactive is we just know this is where we will grow. Industry will spend, customer will spend. So we have now accelerated proactive hiring. And by the time the proactive hires come on board, it takes two to three months when you want to hire some talent that on the, or automatically converts into reactive. By then you have a huge, you know, you have a lot of visibility into what do you need to train them on. And, um, and the leaders and managers, their mindset is also changing and customers are more open to this saying they know that, you know, uh, today, uh, in fact, the whole situation is this, what's happened, the accelerated digital transformation and the war for talent has been a great leveler in the sense Today, whether you are a large multinational technology company, you are a mid-cap company like Zensar, or you're a boutique 50 people company, everybody has the same opportunity to go to Chetan and say, Chetan, we can solve an all-state insurance you know, business problem. So that's become a leveral. So right now it is agility and speed. That's all that the clients really care for. I guess all of this thing that we're trying to do is how do we make sure even if you're not the best fit customer saying give me somebody I can start my program today then having a best team that will start three months later so we have to answer your question simply we've gone on an overdrive on proactively bringing in raw talent and then investing in cultivating the talent to you know make them fit for purpose yeah I think we have done something similar so rather than have clearly defined task-based role profiles for which we hire. We have now called something, called that as adaptive role descriptors, which essentially means there's two things. You have raw talent, so that's assumed. You must show adequate amount of agile capabilities and show adequate amount of cultural fit for the organization. If these two are thick and there is a, 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 a there is an in, inbuilt assumption that there is adequate amount of developable talent in that person, we are going ahead and 
recruiting. And I think I agree with what Pramila just mentioned. I think that's what is the call of the uh, hour, actually. So I'm going to add a different angle. Uh, first of all, I think uh, you all heard the saying, right? Never let a good crisis go to waste. And this has actually been the right time to leverage the crisis. I think most of us did a lot of digital transformation over the over last year. This year, we are seeing the talent uh, challenges and uh, how do we kind of make it all uh, come together? And some of the things we are trying, and I won't say that we are home as yet, but how do we leverage an economy which allows the flexibility to employees and employers both, right? I think flexibility is the key. So while uh, to the point Pramila made that that uh, customers want eligible, eligi sorry, they want urgency, they want somebody to come in very quickly, Employers, employees want flexibility and the time and space to do what they want with their uh, hobbies and family and other preferences, right? And how do you bring these two together? And honestly, I think the gig economy is going to be a good way for us to explore how some of that can come. And I will also, you know, highlight that in the financial service sector, right? Banking, insurance, we are the most risk averse, right? We will be, we will have to be pulled by our hair to come into something like this to say, hey, can you have somebody who's working on your project or program? and working for somebody else, right? And we'll be very, very risk averse about, but I think times have changed. We just need to embrace the reality and say, yeah, that's fine. As long as it doesn't compromise our environment, our data and our IP, maybe that's what we need to do. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to look at that more aggressively and seriously. We're gonna have to allow for much more of flexible working, like part-time working, working two days a week, three days a week, outcome-based work and packaging and such. So I think that's all going to be very interesting for us to, to manage as we move forward. No, you might be on to something which is remarkable. Uh, I know, uh, and this again might sound, uh, you know, American pie. Uh, there are so many women who hesitate to come back because they just can't uh, dedicate five days a week or six days a week to a job or the nine to five to a job. They have kids to you know, who are, who are either uh, in competitive exams or at an age where they need the mom a lot more. And it's not just in India, it's all over the world. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, that, that, that whole segment gets overlooked because most of the time we want full-time uh, employees. And uh, uh, if, if uh, our minds were open to gig employees who were as well trained, uh, but we were able to accommodate their needs, they might accommodate our needs and actually work out much better. So I think a great thought. Uh, let me just ask this question of everyone else. Uh, what do you think about, uh, about taking advantage of a gig workforce? So, um, Sapnish, I'll try this. So, in fact, if we had... I mean, we were doing this session two years back and we said, what do you think about 100% of your people being remote and never coming into work? And you would have got interesting RO answers from all of us saying, yeah. You wouldn't have to ask the question. You'll get a no for an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, just see how, I guess, we have responded to a situation that we were not prepared for. And now as leaders, as organizations, we are much more open to the possibility of driving, disrupting the whole talent model itself. And, and I'm sure we are open. In fact, just building on, you know, trying to get women talent uh, back into the workforce. And we've opened up, we said, you don't ever have to come to any of our campuses. You can continue to be where you are. You don't have to commit eight hours, right? But you have to commit a minimum will be four hours in a day. At this point in time, we are trying to configure roles where even one hour a day would work. But if we can somehow get the platforms right, the technology right, in allowing you know uh, gig workforce to come in to securely you know work on projects, uh, a few logistics. I'm sure again as an industry, we are very very creative and we will respond to that. But the war for talent is going to go on. You're going to go into every untapped talent pool that's available, and I'm sure a few of us. I know some companies have already launched those gig 
workforce platforms. They will mature over a period of time. And I'll not be surprised next year when you're doing this conference, we would have cracked the code and we would have serious work being done by gig work. It's happening for the SMEs. There are several freelancing, uh, freelancing architects, domain consultants, but we need gig work for that model to come down to the basic programmers and the coding level. Uh, I'm sure we will get there. Yeah, but Sipnish, there's, there's some challenges there, right? I mean, uh, the day the government takes away our opportunity to work from remote, which means saying, come back to the export zones, the whole thing falls apart, right? And so that's one challenge that we are kind of grappling with and saying, where, you know, when does this uh, you know, clock turn back a little bit and how much does it turn back, right? I mean, that's, that's one part. Uh, but, but, you know, we did try and look at crowdsourcing as a way of doing this, right? I mean, at one point in time, uh, including putting enough tools, having a blockchain based credentialing system to try and make sure who are you. I mean, if, you know, it was saying project anywhere, source anywhere, right? Across the IBM population, anywhere in the world, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the challenges were more regulatory and, and uh, uh, commercial to some extent than it was, you know, uh, can we make it happen? Yeah, technologically we can make it happen easily. And we, we did uh, some development around it as well. But I think uh, a lot will depend on which way the regulations go in the, in the longer period of time, because if we are asked to come back to the export zones, you know, uh, Pramila, me, Venki, anybody, we'll have to just bring them back home and saying that, look, you need to work from a site. So that's one part. We did experiment with what we call dynamic delivery in India, I mean, around the world, that's in IBM, which is saying uh, a close kind of a, you know, takeoff from crowd service, but was saying that, look, I will now try and source from wherever in the world. And do I have systems that allow me to integrate a delivery team across five centers uh, by design? I mean, we, we do a lot of, you know, cross center delivery. We do a lot of delivery with India, Brazil, Mexico, all of that is pretty common, but to be able to do this by design was what we were trying to do. So we did a fairly extensive piece of work on what we call dynamic delivery, which took care of everything, including security requirements and everything else. But all of those, like, uh, you know, Ramana said, I think, uh, you know, it'll take us time to mature it to the, the real gig economy world, basically from an IT standpoint. And a reasonable amount of it, considering the scale we have in India, all of us, I think will also be dependent on where the regulatory environment takes us to a large extent. I'm, I'm sure the builders are lobbying pretty hard for everybody to come back to work. Uh, but I'm just saying, where will this go? Will, will, will you know, define that. Technologically, we can make this happen. And we've experimented with that. Uh, uh, one question. Uh, I know, uh, uh, Anuj, you spoke a little bit about using an ecosystem, but everyone else talked about trying to solve the problem yourselves. Um, have you, uh, from an overall perspective, looked at the ecosystem that's around you to help you solve the problem. And uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing there might be folks in the audience from the ecosystem. Uh, uh, what are the problems that you would want others to solve so that you can get ahead on your talent transformation agenda? So a few things here, right? I mean, uh, last year we broke all kinds of records on uh, certifying and training people actually, working directly with uh, our partners in, in, in Red Hat, Adobe, AWS, Azure, you, you name it, right? I mean, uh, I, you remember I told you about the adjacent skills and you know, you know, training and deploying or certifying and deploying. Uh, we did a ton of that last year because we had to do it very, very quickly and rapidly. Uh, we broke possibly the world record in trainings that we did on Azure with Microsoft. Right. So there's a lot of work that we did with partners and with some, in fact, uh, with, with Adobe and with the Red Hat, we also ran hackathons actually um, for both ideation and for, you know, training people basically, uh, which helped us get to some talent. So I think it was, it is a, uh, I mean, uh, you can solve it, will it solve everything? No, I mean, the scale that we have challenges on, I think, yeah, it's a good, good, you know, problem to take and solve. Uh, but yeah, I think very successful partnerships that we have seen with them, you know, they've all been very, very open to coming and working with us and making us, you know, uh, solve this uh, challenge that we have. I mean, and they've also been happy because we've got them the certification numbers they needed in partners, right? But I think it's been 
mutual to the extent that it's, we've, we've been able to get and train and deploy lots of talent working with partners like Salonas, Red Hat, AWS, Microsoft, you name it. I think it's just Adobe, SFDC, lots of them, right? And we've done a lot of that work last year uh, with them breaking all records that we've ever had in the past. Uh, so, Sapnish, uh, I'm going to bring in a point which is uh, which affects all of us, and all of us have a role to play in it, as you said, in the ecosystem. We've got these notice periods for our employees, right? Two months and three months which really creates a situation where we appear really unprofessional globally because we have all these guys fishing around for multiple jobs. And we in this group, for example, need to be the pioneers somewhere to say, right, let's look at what is realistic. Do you really need a two month and a three month notice period? Uh, and if we can bring it down to something reasonable, let's say a month, it's going to make a big difference in our talent acquisition, in talent movement and our professional positioning in the global world, right? I think that as an ecosystem is something we all need to somewhere make a decision and move forward with. So, so Chetan, as you take that, right, let's look at another aspect of it, right? Um, we are poaching from each other. I mean, it's a fact, right? Everybody actually, right? We are driving this market up without planning and saying, what do we need to do together as an ecosystem, right? I think you address that and the notice period will go away. Right, because what's happening now is, uh, you know, we are hiring from each other and, and, and everybody is actually, and we're driving price points up. We are creating a, I would say, not an artificial, uh, you know, uh, shortage of talent, but we're creating a kind of an ecosystem which is just spiraling up basically, right? So shorter notice period will not solve that problem, will not shorten it, will not necessarily solve a talent problem from an eco, I mean, the, 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 in the India ecosystem, what talent we have is what we have. How are we adding to that is becoming a bigger issue in my mind than about our ability to shift between each other. Because we are shifting between each other like never before in life. I mean, I can see it. You go to LinkedIn, by the way, and just type serving notice period. I didn't know this. Uh, my talent acquisition team showed me that. You will have all companies, employees who have resigned have three months notice period and they're fishing for the next hire offer. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, I mean you know, and maybe I'm old school there. But, you know, where is this, you know, customer saying, are you joining an organization for a career or are you joining with the best pay you can gouge out of it, right? So I think in, in that kind of a system, I think we need to get together. I'm not trying to, you know, manage the compensation in different levels and I'm not trying to rig a system, right? All I'm just saying is we need to get together and solve a broader ecosystem problem where we say, look, if there's a shortage of talent, getting it from each other is not the only solution. And unfortunately, you go back to your principles and I can go back to my clients and I say, look, I'll give you a, a, a good graduate hire, knows what to do. And please take them and let's say, no, we need a three, three years experience with four legs, five arms. And that's all we'll take. And then we go after each of the talent. I mean, it's, it's becoming a kind of a, I mean, it's, it's a very, when I say it's fun, it's also a very interesting situation to be in, in this market. And I think while I agree on the notice period, but I think there's a bigger problem that we need to solve together as a team. No, so Anuj, I think it's an and, not an or. I'm not saying that's the only yeah. thing. It's really an and. And if you look at the US market for a minute, they have the same issue. There's a lot of talent mo movement around, but there's nobody fishing for five jobs. And yeah. we are creating an artificial market here with this compensation going up. And that's really something we as leaders need to address in some fashion. I'm just putting it out there, I think, because of the ecosystem yeah. point, but I'm sure there are many others. And, you know, uh, so I, I think I think both the points are very valid. I think like Anuj pointed out, uh, if all that we did was overfish one pond, then the price of that fish is going to go up, no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, uh, like you pointed out also, if we streamlined how we fish, uh, things might become better. But uh, I agree on both. I think, I think all ideas have merit and uh, just as expanding the pond has merit, merit just as uh, streamlining the fishing has merit. Uh, but I think, uh, I know we are running out of time, but I would say just as we solved the digital transformation challenge and we got an opportunity and we nailed it, I think the talent transformation challenge is a much smaller challenge. You don't have to convince anyone that it's a challenge. <laughs> digital transformation, you had to go out and you had to do all kinds of things to con convince your customers and your principals that, it's, that it could become real. Now it's real. Uh, talent transformation. Uh, I, I remember for an IIT outside of India, IBM was our first customer. 
And when I uh, met with the person there, she said that, look, IBM has written the book on change. We've gone through so many cycles that we know exactly what to do in every cycle. But in Anuj's words, in the last 30 years, he hasn't seen such a change. So all the very best. Uh, I think if we can do digital transformation, I'm sure we can do talent transformation and better days ahead. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoyed Thanks. it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Back to you, Dilip. Thank you, Sapnesh. Thank you, Sapnesh. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for the meaningful discussion into navigating the next talent at the heart of.